This week, how technology is being used as a tool of abuse and how it can help survivors. The latest offering from Apple and the next generation of games consoles is here. Nearly. Welcome to Click. For many of us, 2020 has been the year we've all been stuck at home more than we would have liked. Now, for some, spending more time with our partners has been great. For some, it's started to great. But there are those for whom being locked down with someone else has been no joke at all. We've heard a lot about how mental health issues have been on the rise because of the pandemic, but so has domestic abuse. And sadly, some technology can make it easier to abuse a partner or even ex-partner who's been trying to break away. The abuse in my relationship was kind of emotional abuse. Things being said rather than physical. Nothing really being done that was obviously tangible, but that changed very quickly compounded by a lot of issues during the lockdown, a lot of stress, financial stress as well. I realised, you know, there was a lot of financial control, um, control of sort of over how often I could work. Um, I realised actually how much he was limiting my ability to work. Meet Kate and Sue. Well, those are the names that we've given to protect their anonymity for their own safety. Their stories are some of many experienced during lockdown. In the first few weeks, the police received a domestic disturbance call almost every 30 seconds. In 2019, in the UK alone, there were almost two and a half million domestic abuse cases reported, and many still go unrecorded. When I was trying to leave, I found that he was um, monitoring my location on my phone, um, monitoring my screen time that was being shared with him. Increasingly, technology has become a tool for abuse. Survivors often reporting being stalked through tracking apps on their phones, keyloggers on their computers, or their lives being controlled through smart devices in their homes. When he left the house, that's when I started to see that he was using the Ring doorbell camera to track me. I could take the battery out if I wanted to, but I didn't feel like I could do that because he would say to me, you're compromising our children's safety. I was worried that he would go to the police and try and suggest that I'm a bad mother. Kate sought help from women's domestic violence charity Refuge. Although such abuse can happen to anyone, women are still almost three times more likely to experience violence and harassment. And the charity says over 70% of those contacting it have experienced some technological abuse, one of the things it specialises in dealing with. And the law is finally catching up. The UK recently passed a landmark domestic abuse bill, recognising that tech abuse is part of the problem. It'll make it illegal to use modern technology to track or spy on a partner or ex-partner. But beyond the legislation, there's a wider debate around the products themselves and whether they should be designed to offer better protection in these scenarios. It's really important to recognize that we're moving away from a personal device setting. That's why it's called PC, personal computer, and we all used to have our own smartphone, to an environment where we have collective devices that are shared in the household. Often the perpetrator, who tends very often to be male, is the person that purchases device, maintains the device, and also disposes of the device. And that gives that person a lot of control over both the environment they're in, but also the device and its settings. So a small team of employees at IBM have decided to try and solve the problem. They've devised a new set of design principles for tech companies to build on. Right at the beginning of our research, we saw that there is help and guidance available to people who are facing this kind of abuse. But 
the bulk of it focuses on keeping safe by educating yourself in the technology. We believe that the burden of safety shouldn't fall solely on the shoulders of the end user. And we felt it was important to shift at least some of that onus onto thoughtful designs. The list IBM has devised is long, but they do have some interesting points. Take, for example, a box like this that looks pretty harmless, a place where you might leave a nice gift message for somebody, or when it comes to online banking, somewhere where you might make a note of a reference. But they're also being used for more sinister purposes, a place where perpetrators can continue their abuse. One suggested solution is to make them smart, automatically monitoring for abusive language or patterns of behaviour to potentially spot and stop them happening. But some changes suggested are hard to implement and need a bigger rethink. If the devices in our home had obvious alerts when they are remotely activated and kept a digital record of who did what when, this would make it difficult for abusers to obscure and distort the truth. Furthermore, having a manual override on the devices would return some of the power to the local user. With smart devices becoming more commonplace, this issue has become more urgent to tackle. Everything I had was like hand-me-down phones, hand-me-down laptops. So he would set up all the accounts um, he would set up family sharing on things. Um, there was various Alexa devices all over the, the property. Um, he could go to someone's house and ring the Alexa when we were at home. Family apps are another area of concern, something that many of us use to monitor our children's safety. But in an abusive relationship, they're also the apps that are most open to misuse because they're all about sharing information. Even though the location data is central to the app's function, most don't notify users when they've been tracked or constantly push users to turn location settings on even when they've been actively disabled. There are better designs out there. For example, Monzo, the online banking app, has a share with us feature, which allows customers to message the bank directly, leaving no trace behind that a conversation has even taken place. As our digital lives become more intertwined with our home lives, these issues will only become more prevalent. I think the companies should know what the products could be used for. And when you're in a couple and the account is going to be registered to one email address, when something goes wrong, the person can't rectify anything or change details, you are stuck. He locked me out of our shared Amazon account, which had my credit card details for all the payments. I rang up Amazon and I said, I can't take my cards off from this account. Well, they said, sorry, you just have to cancel your bank cards. My mobile phone was registered to his Apple ID and I didn't even realise the significance of an Apple ID. I do now. I've been on the phone to Apple three times and it got to the point where they said, he has to give you the code. Designs to better protect against controlling and stalking behaviour can improve privacy and security for all of us. But for the hundreds of millions affected by domestic abuse every year, change can't come soon enough. I just suddenly realised I'm in this situation and I'm in this like bubble and I've got no idea how I'm going to get out of it. He's got all the money, he's stopped me working, the kids are at home being home edited now because he's like really worried about Covid, like we are all in this bubble in the house and he like even when I leave he can see my location through my watch or my phone or my iPad, anything. I, I just realised how little control I had over mine and the kids' life um, and how much he had. And yeah, once I, once I realised, I was like, oh my God, I need to get us out. Domestic abuse, of course, knows no geographical boundaries. And during lockdown, many countries reported seeing an increase. South Africa has one of the highest rates of violence against women in the world and the number of sexual offences including rape is rising. It's been reported that a woman is murdered every three hours and 51% of South African women have experienced violence at the hands of someone that they're in a relationship with. 
And what's more, attitudes towards abuse in many countries like South Africa means that the women can actually end up being blamed and shamed, even by those whose job is to help them. Now, a chatbot called Rainbow, aimed at South African users, is trying to turn this tide. Abuse is an isolating experience. Victims often feel uncomfortable talking to friends or family. It invites users to take part in quizzes and stories in order to help them to better understand what is and isn't abuse. The AI element is trained to learn people's behaviour and detect nuances in the language of the user that could indicate they're in an abusive relationship. Survivors are then guided to the areas of help and actions open to them. I was date raped twice and I think that happened because I didn't know my rights that well. I didn't see the red lights that would make me recognize that I was in danger. That made me recognize that my boundaries were being crossed. I just assume only initially thought I'm the one that read the signs wrong. This is Tuli, as we're calling her. And she's not alone. Last year, 42,000 women in South Africa reported being raped. When we were out and having drinks, they were spending all this money on me and I was feeling like I was special. So when it happened, I blamed myself because I thought I just spent all of this man's money on me. I did not stand up for myself. That's the case with many girls here in South Africa. Using the Rainbow Chatbot has now helped Tuli to recognize her rights. What looking through board did for me and can do for others is to remind people that a person needs consent. Before a person touches you, you need to be okay with that. Had I known that I would have known that people had crossed boundaries and maybe I would have reported it. After levels of abuse rose around the globe during lockdown, numerous celebrities and social media influencers decided to help raise awareness of the issue. In South Africa, actor Tendaishe Chitima, star of the Netflix film Cook Off, decided to add her support to the Rainbow Chatbot, which now has some 18,000 users. I had an ex-partner who was stalking me and cyberbullying me online. You mentioned that you had an awakening and, and that seemed to be the point where you realised, hang on, this is not okay, the relationship I'm in. Personally, I didn't see it as abuse until I started getting depressed and I wasn't myself anymore. And I remember speaking to an aunt and she literally said to me that, oh my gosh, this man really loves you because you know he kept pursuing me but it was a toxic kind of pursuing you know and so that was really bad it was it was terrible really the feeling of it i had been getting depressed i wasn't eating properly anymore and i find that rainbow is a, it's a platform that um, allows women to speak to a friendly non-judgmental chat box and how innovative is that would there have been anything on the chat bot that would have been relevant to you? To be honest, if I if I'd known about Rainbow before, I probably would have utilized um, their platform even more um, when I was going through what I was going through because I would have wanted to know, can I report this to the police? Can I get a lawyer involved? What are the legal um, instruments available to me? This chat box is not designed to judge you. It's not designed to to you know to even tell you to leave your partner. It's designed to offer solutions and to trigger action. Hello and welcome to the week in tech. It was the week a rocket designed to launch and return humans to and from Earth safely touched down in Texas, thanks to Amazon founder Jeff Bezos and his aerospace firm Blue Origin. Facebook banned posts that deny or distort the Holocaust after a successful campaign led by survivors of the Nazi genocide. The Chinese city of Shenzhen has handed out 10 million yuan in a pilot of its mobile-first currency. 
50,000 citizens received the equivalent of around £20 to spend in local stores. BBC Microbit, the pocket-sized computer used by millions of children worldwide, has just announced its first major tech upgrade. Initially rolled out in 2016, the device now comes with a speaker, a microphone, artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities. Scientists have built ear pods that can monitor muscle movements to translate facial expressions. Researchers say these could turn important facial cues into avatars, emoji or speech commands in remote work or learning environments. And finally, who wouldn't want an army of tiny robot artists? In a world first, researchers have shown how robot swarms can follow instructions to create art in real time. Yes, they say the bots, which leave colour trails on the canvas, are a new tool in what remains a largely manual craft. Looks like a brush with greatness. <laughs>We are fully in the grip of tech launch season and following on from Google and Amazon, this week it's Apple's turn, so let's see what they announce. First up is a new smart speaker, this is the HomePod Mini. This is the first new HomePod they've announced since the original came out in 2018, whereas Google and Amazon have had several iterations of theirs. The HomePod Mini looks a bit like the new Amazon Echo because it's spherical. And a new feature is that you can now send intercom messages between HomePods and other Apple products, a bit like you can with Amazon Echo. We're late, let's go. Hey Siri, reply. We're on to the iPhone now. This is the iPhone 12, which they say has an all new design. Although one that I think has taken a lot of design cues from the iPhone 4. These will be the first 5G iPhones, just like Samsung, Google and others have added 5G connectivity to their flagship handsets. And 5G coverage is still quite patchy at the moment and a lot of us aren't going out and about doing very much at the moment, so this is kind of an investment for the future, I think. I don't think many of us will be taking full advantage of 5G just yet. This is quite interesting. They say the phone will only use the 5G when necessary if you're trying to stream a movie or something. That's to conserve battery life because 5G can use more battery power. They're also making the screen tougher with what they're calling ceramic shield, which makes it four times more likely to survive a drop, which is great news because I'm forever smashing my screen protector. Okay, this is interesting. They say this is gonna be the first smartphone to have a five nanometer process chip. And what that means is you're packing in billions more transistors onto the processor. That gives it more brain power and also can make it more energy efficient. And they say we'll be able to use this for 4K video editing, and console quality video games. They're also bringing out an iPhone 12 mini with all the same features, it's just smaller to cover all the bases. There are two new Pro models as well. They're adding a LiDAR scanner to both, like you might find in a self-driving car. That can help the phone sense depth, which could be useful for photography. It helps you autofocus very quickly, and also augmented reality applications. I think a lot of people were hoping they would get rid of the lightning port from the iPhone and replace it with USB-C, which is the common standard now. They've already done it for the iPad Pro and the MacBook Pro, and that would mean you could use any USB-C charger, even from an Android phone on the iPhone, but they haven't done it this year. And that was it. Nothing too surprising there, a bit of a refresh for the iPhone 12. I think a lot of people were hoping for more flashy features, but actually the introduction of the five nanometer chip and the 5G connectivity could prove very significant. And we'll have to see what kind of experiences they enable in the future. Anyway, those were the latest next gen smartphones from Apple. We're also about to see two next gen games consoles, the PS5 and the Xbox Series X. The Xbox will be first out of the traps, launching on November the 10th. Ahead of a full review next month, Mog Chislak has been one of the lucky few to get his hands on a Series X to be able to give us a preview. Here I am playing a next-gen game on a next-gen machine, the Xbox Series X. But this is only really a taster of the next-gen experience, rather than the full three courses. You see, the console that I've been using for the last couple of weeks is pre-release. That means that lots and lots of things, from the user interface to its overall performance, will be tweaked and changed 
by the time people get their hands on the finished machine. So, for the purposes of a preview, we can only really talk about a limited number of its features. The first next-gen games we get to preview are certainly an odd couple. Japanese RPG Yakuza Like a Dragon and racing title Dirt 5, two completely different games that demonstrate that the next generation looks quite a bit like the current generation, but with a bit more polish. A role-playing game with turn-based combat like Yakuza is perhaps not the best title to show off this new machine's abilities. Wanna fight? A slightly surreal take on life as a Japanese gangster, it looks nice enough with a smooth frame rate and sharp visuals, but it's not what you'd call a poster child for the next gen. Da -da -da -da! Never fear, part-time hero is here. For that, you need a game with a bit more visual razzle-dazzle, which is where racing titles usually shine. Off-road racing across a huge variety of tracks in all weathers is the order of the day here. But again, apart from good, but not amazing visuals, I'm yet to get any of the next-gen feels from either of these games. Much has been made of the Series X ability to drastically reduce load times. This is thanks in part to its NVMe SSD and the Velocity architecture which joins up all of the console's new hardware to some smart software. There are still load times, but they're much shorter. When we compare it to the machine it replaces, you can see the differences appear. If you're playing No Man's Sky on the One X, it takes about a minute and a half to load. On the Series X, it's about 20 seconds, much faster. And when the game's up and running, we see some stability improvements in the visuals as well. Then we come to Quick Resume. On current gen machines, if you want to play a different game to the one you're already playing, loading up the next title can take several minutes. Now, it's just seconds. On Series X, Quick Resume drastically reduces the time it takes to switch between titles, and games pick up right where you left them. So far, I've tested this to be able to resume about five games at any one time, but that could change with the finished machine. Lots has been made about backwards compatibility on this generation of consoles. And there is a very large back compatible catalogue that the Series X can play. It's also been suggested that next gen games will cost as much as £70 a pop. And the launch lineup of titles for the Series X and PS5 isn't exactly stellar. So a back catalogue of older but well regarded games helps bolster the proposition. For Series X, it enjoys quite a lot of backwards compatibility, with a lot, but not all, old Xbox games. That includes games from the Xbox One, 360 and original machine. Onto the machine itself. It's a commanding presence in the living room, much larger than the machine it replaces, the Xbox One X. While the older machine discreetly slots away beneath TVs across the globe, the Series X towers next to the TV. It looks a little bit like the monolith from 2001, A Space Odyssey. However, like most of us during lockdown, it seems to have piled on the pounds. It is a big bit of kit. And the console itself, while visually it takes up a fair bit of real estate, is whisper quiet. When I'm stood over the top of it, I can hear almost nothing, and I'm right on top of the fan. If this were a human being, I'd be sticking a mirror under its nose to check that it was breathing. We're now in the final straight before the launch of all of the next-gen consoles. We'll bring you reviews of this and its cheaper, less powerful sibling, the Series S, as well as the PS5, ahead of their launch next month. That was Mark previewing what may be the last generation of physical games consoles. What do you think? Oh, I don't know. Streaming has certainly shaken up TV and film, so maybe gaming will be next. Maybe. It's all down to your connection speed, isn't it? Anyway, that is it for this week. As ever, you can find the team throughout the week on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.